so much. It's a treat to be here this evening with our guest because, like us, uh, he's been pretty active on this year old internet for the last 20 years. Uh, as the CEO of Betaworks, he has invested in literally dozens of Webby winners, including Tumblr, Venmo, Medium, BuzzFeed, Kickstarter. That's only five. There are many more. Not to mention Webby winning products they're building at Betaworks Studio, like Giphy, Dots, and Bitly. And I would say even in a broader sense, the work, he, the work he and Betaworks are doing is shaping the internet we, or at least I, at least I do, use every day. Uh, they're investors in Chartbeat, which at the Webby Awards we use to monitor webbyawards.com and has been quite crucial in helping us know when Justin Bieber tweets uh, to vote for him and sometimes taking our site down. Uh, he has invested in Gimlet Media, which makes a bunch of podcasts that I listen to all the time, uh, and also in uh, Choir, actually, which is a crowdfunding platform which Gimlet used, I think, to raise uh, money, which, if you were following that. Uh, and then, you know, there's some small things like Twitter and Airbnb, which we use to not only share info about the Webby Awards, of course, but also to book um, our staff off-sites. Sir, I don't know how to say this, uh, and I mean this in the, in the most positive way possible, possible, but you are absolutely an internet beast, if I have ever seen one. Uh, please join me in welcoming John Borthwick. Um, there's lots of stuff I want to cover. I, I'd love to talk about a bunch of topics. Uh, Claire mentioned the internet can't be stopped, and uh, you and I have chatted about uh, some different elements and areas we focus on. I think to start, though, I would love for you to tell people about what Betaworks does so they understand that sort of difference between the studio model that you have and the companies that you actually have in Betaworks sure. at your office and the ones that you're invested in. Just giving people an overview of that. Sure. So, um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so I refer to what we do at Betaworks as, um, as a studio, and I refer to Betaworks as a studio, as an internet studio, as a startup studio. And what we do is we work with um, internet entrepreneurs to build companies as a co-founder in the company creation process at the studio. So it's ground up company creation is job number one at the studio. And then Related to that, we do seed investing. So we've done about 120 seed investments since we started Betaworks. <coughs> and seed investing for us is, um, is totally related to our company building process because we're thesis driven. We kind of know what we want to do and we have a theory about the world and we go after it by building things in that space and then by seed investing around the things that we've built. So it's, it's what I sometimes refer to as sort of building and investing in clusters or ecosystems. So you mentioned Gimlet, right? So about a year and a half, two years ago, we became really interested in the audio space. And so Gimlet is one thing we've done in there. We've done about four other things now in the audio space, some of them public, some of them not public yet. But you'll see us do more stuff in the audio space. So. Um, we're, we're interested in spoken word audio, we're interested in podcasting, we're interested in discovery, we're interested in everything from the front end user experience all the way down to the analytics that a, uh, a publisher or a podcast creator needs. Um, I kind of wanted to focus on three for selfish reasons, it's sort of what we've been looking at. Um, and you know, Claire mentioned uh, this idea about the internet can't be stopped, and it's something that we at the Webbies have been. Uh, really focusing on this year. And the general concept and idea that we have seen is just, you know, as people have been celebrating the internet for 20 years, we've seen this incredible way the internet, internet has transformed society at large. And you could, you know, I'll list a couple of examples. We could all talk about this on and on and on. Um, you could look at the health space of today. You could look at activity trackers, all the information that we have about food, uh, all the different ways, WebMD back in the day. I mean, there's a million things there. Uh, you could look at um, journalism, real-time news, uh, people are periscoping people on the Syrian, on the trail of refugees from Syria to Europe. Uh, really an incredible, incredible stuff there. Um, you can even look at cities and how the internet is transforming cities with navigation and so forth. So it goes on and on. But what we really were sort of taken aback by is in general, in culture, you see this huge discussion, this ongoing discussion around people's concerns in technology, right? So if you look at television shows like Black Mirror or films like Ex Machina or 
articles in the news today about drones, about self-driving cars, about losing jobs to technology. So that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, and looking at how technology is shaping the future and how you guys are approaching these spaces. And specifically, it's around work, uh, around relationships, and this idea of agency or decision making. And I thought, you know, I, I know you guys have done and talked recently a lot about some of this stuff in agency, uh, around agency, and I would love to start there. And so for us, what we looked at, and I would love you to broaden this out and talk about it a bit, but is just how technology is helping people make decisions, you know? And so from a broad perspective, uh, we're using Netflix, we're using uh, Spotify to help us make decisions about what we watch and we listen to. We're using ways to help us make decisions about which routes we may take. Uh, we're potentially in the long run maybe using uh, Google cars, if you will, to even drive us places. Um, and so how are you guys approaching that space? Because it is a, a, a pretty big shift in the way you would distribute content, publish content, um, share information if all this automation is, is sort of uh, very involved in that decision-making process. Yeah. Well, let me um, let me pick a place to start, and then you can <coughs> you can navigate through it a little bit and see. Most importantly, I think about when I think about agency, is that I think that we we as human beings are we our relationship to technology is changing fundamentally, and um, we are integrating technology and um, in, into our into our lives and into our beings. I think far faster than we give um, than it's happening far faster than we think, and it's also far more insidious than we think. And I say insidious, and in, it's not. I think Black Mirror and and things like that are, are useful because they sort of they hold a mirror to us on just how. Um, how we're applying this technology to our own lives, to our relationships, to, to how we think, uh, to how we live, uh, how we work, how we love, without, um, since it happens step by step, it, it's very hard for us to get any perspective on you know, how far we've come in the last decade or the last 20 years. And I think that sort of we're, we're collectively boiling ourselves, you know, we're sort of that proverbial frog being boiled in the soup of technology. And I think a lot of it is incredibly empowering, and then a lot of it is just changing us as people. Yeah. Um, Do you think it, it's faster than it has been in the past? Is yeah, the I think it's happening yeah. much faster because I think that what's, you know, sort of a fundamental property of the internet is that all of the uh, all of these technologies are stacked, and the stacking phenomena. You know, we now have a, a single platform where all of our media, all of our communications is happening on a single platform. And so every single innovation, everything that is incremental to that platform builds on everything before. And so that stacking, I think, sort of changes the architecture, right? In the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted to, if you were in the business of creating automobiles and you wanted to create motorcycles, you, you had a whole bunch of equipment you could take from one factory to the other, but you couldn't just fundamentally just build it right on top of the same uh, production line. Here, we're building right on top of the same production line. And I think that that means that we're building a lot faster. It's a lot more integrated. Um, we're, we're a lot more dependent on it. And, um, and I think it's happening faster and faster. Um, and so it's the sort of, there's an equivalent to Moore's law, which is just, which is a curve of integration of technology into our lives. And I'm sure that a lot of people here, when Sandy hit New York, um, you know, I, I live in downtown Manhattan, and myself and my family were out of power for four days. And you could see the, the technology stack that we're building doesn't degrade gracefully, right? It just, it, it, you, you, when something like Sandy hits, it's just gone. And, um, and so I think that there's, you know, that, that stack is, um, is fairly brittle. Yeah. And, it, and it's hard to see that from the outside. So. Um, I think that there's, um, you know, it, it's hard to, to get back to the, the agency point, is that sort of the way you started, is that I think understanding what human agency is, what it means to, you know, you used examples like ways and navigational examples. You know, mo most fundamentally, I think that, you know, m most people don't, um, 
it's very hard for us to understand and to think that the Facebook news feed is algorithmically driven. And really understand that that's what we're seeing is we're seeing a result of our own preferences and our own clicks. Um, the same thing for search, right? Um, there's been some fascinating studies that have been done in the last couple of years and looking at the way that people use search, looking at the way that search has sort of modified um, and, and uh, people's perception of news. And so we have these algorithms that are now sort of, you know, give us unparalleled access to information, but that our agency and our um, relationship to that, to, to information and to discovery is being mediated by algorithms um, in a whole in a whole different way. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think if you went back to the early days of the web, we could say on some level, search was a, medi a mediator to, to the web and to how things were distributed. And if you didn't, you know, you still today, but if you didn't do good on Google in 1999, you were going to have some problems getting out there. How does the, how does the, I would say, increased complexity around that type of problem and what you described, how does that inform your thesis and how you approach investing in things today, knowing that these algorithms are so important that there's so many decision points that are being made for us based on taste and preferences. Like, how are you thinking about what you're investing in? And well, I mean, it? so about about five years ago, we um, we we moved pretty much all of the things we were doing at BetaWorks uh, to be mobile first, and so to think about mobile as a native experience. I think that. In the early days of mo mobile, it was excusable that many of us um, just extended our web properties um, to mobile. And I think that there was just a, there was a point for us, it was about five years ago, where you had to flip everything around and say, what is the, what is the mobile first experience of this particular product? And that would mean, you know, top, top to tail. So it would have everything from sign up to the um, uh, to being able to share, being able to all of the experience, because mobile used to be just a small, small window. Um, as we moved to mobile, I think that it it changed it changed a lot of what we do at BetaWorks. But I think that now we're seeing this sort of evolution of mobile, where you know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. But there is a um, there's a saturation level that we've reached in the App Store where there's about 45,000 new apps which are coming out every month. Uh, the app store is a dysfunctional retail environment. And I think that people have today, basically they have their mobile real estate filled out. And so they have the basic mobile apps that they're interested so in. So it's really hard to get on somebody's home so screen now, right? It's, it's, it is it's hard almost hard. impossible. And I think also that the home screen itself, which for a while, this sort of hierarchical directory where people would you know, they would have 50, 60 apps on their phones, but they would frequently use about 10 of them that they would have on the home screen. <coughs> I think the home screen as a navigational s sort of device has become less interesting and less useful. And you guys, so, just, and just because I know you guys have done some research here, and I think probably people think it's interesting, you guys have looked at a lot of home screens. Am I, am I right on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did about, um, about two years ago, we started, um, our data science team started looking at a lot of home screens. And so we were, I can hear it. You can't? Okay. Um, is that better? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, I'm a low talker, so that may be it. Um, so home screen. So, so we started looking at, um, uh, we, about two years ago, we started looking at a lot of home screens. Our data science team uh, was scraped. Uh, we scraped about 10,000 home screens off Twitter and off Instagram. And, then and so that's people literally who are posting pictures of their home screens. Yeah. You guys are finding them and you're in analyzing. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And, and much of it was happening around the new year. So people would sort of post, here's my home screen, you know, hashtag, I think it was, I think it was 2012 that we did it the first time, 2013. Um, so people would post uh, at the new year, they'll be like, here's my home screen. For the is, that, is that something you guys sort of like started or that you just noticed that was happening? No, or? it was a phenomenon that we noticed. I mean, we, we, we have a whole set of tools that we use to look at sort of trending, trending memes. And this was something that people were doing. And we said, okay, if we grab these home screens, which people are publicly posting, and we can do a little bit of sort of basically character recognition, 
and understand what apps are on the home screen, we can get a sense of how people are organizing their home screens, what people think is important, and, um, and what people have on their home screens. So we did that. We then actually extended that and started, we launched a product which we called Hash Home Screen. And the product was an app, and the app would let you very simply take a screenshot of your home screen. And then if you're a friend of mine, we'd author it through Twitter or through other networks, but it was primarily Twitter. But if you're a friend of my, if I friended you on Twitter and you post in your home screen, then I would see your home screen in there. And so it would basically be a social sharing of home screen. And we developed that app until Apple told us to turn it off. So <laughs> it's too much, too easy to discover new things and too. Uh, they said to us, this making is, the app store look bad. I guess they, they said this is potentially a competitive app store. <laughs> and we said, well, we're pointing everything to your app store, and they said, take it down. And we said, sure. okay, yeah. What, and so what do you think that what were the things you sort of noticed there that would maybe would be counterintuitive? So, um, I mean, there was a lot of things that we learned from it. But I would say, let me give you about five things. Is Number one is we saw that people were very ready to switch out their default apps. Right. Right. So when so you, you what know, you find there when you download it's not, apps, was you not know, what was there. All, all the Apple stuff, people were very, very ready to switch out. So that was kind of surprising. Um, second thing we found out is that you know if you look if you look across mobile, um, you know the single uh, largest category of time engagement and of um, of place to make money is gaming, and yet very few people have games on their home screen. Interesting. And so the theory was, or our th what we thought, I thought, is that people are sort of. They're a little bit embarrassed about right. Clash of There's some times. identity shaping about yeah. what they let people see on their exactly. home screen, what they want people to think about exactly. them. Exactly. So they push that to the second screen. Um, third thing is we saw was the incredible penetration that Facebook had on the home screen. Uh, uh, fourth thing we saw was the that I can't remember the numbers, but Google's penetration was actually remarkably low. Um, now that's if you assume that, you look at somebody's home screen, I, I can't see whether you are, use IMAP and you auth into Gmail, so using you know, a mailbox app or some other third party client. But Google's actual clients, their apps on people's home screens, if I remember right, YouTube was around 14% of home screens and that was about it. Yeah. And so it was kind of like it was surprisingly, uh, un, Google was surprisingly not present. Uh, talk about not present, Microsoft was MIA, you know, Yahoo was MIA, you know, a lot of the big tech companies. Um, fifth thing we found also was shopping. Um, so Amazon was surprisingly small. And so I think that I think that e-commerce has been a laggard in terms of its, you know, sort of the mobile experience in e-commerce. I think this, this holiday season, uh, this past Black Friday, you know, you had a bunch of um, you had a bunch of analysts saying that it will be the tipping point for mobile for e-commerce, and I think that uh, you know media and uh, and services sort of front ended the shift to mobile, and e-commerce you know, took place a little bit later. Yeah. So that was the fifth thing we found out. So, so things. you're looking at this environment where it's really hard to get on the home screen. Uh, we have software making a lot of decisions for people, but it's hard to get into the places into those places. Uh, and, and the sort of big players, Twitter, Facebook, maybe Pinterest, whatever those things are, are really routing people for the most part, right? And so how are you approaching, are you thinking about, if this is the environment, you know, that, you know I think about like when I'm on Waze and it tells me that Dunkin' Donuts is on Third Avenue, suddenly that seems like an interesting thing and now Waze right. is kind of deciding what I might drive by right. and giving me an ad, not just giving me an ad the place I do drive by, but they might actually be routing me, Right. not that they're, Ways, they're very nice people at Waze, so I don't mean to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but how are you thinking about so, that stuff? So, how is that so informing thinking, your thesis? So we're thinking about it, there's a couple of different ways we're thinking about it. I think that on, uh, on one hand, you could say that you know, there's some saturation point, point that we've reached in terms of mobile discovery. And it's been driven by the fact that people have filled out that app space, the fact that store's not so functional, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, is that I think that if you look at this device, you know, it, it is, uh, it's still very, very early days for the development of the device, the development of the sensors, how the sensors relate to physical space, and how app developers, you know, can basically 
uh, touch people and uh, in ways that are more contextually relevant at the right time in the right place. So trying so, to get on the home screen is sort of like a 2012-13 issue, and if you're fighting that, you're sort of behind the times, and right. it's the other places that right. are the so, fertile ground. So you know, the places that we are, you know, we have a whole category of things that we're doing at Betaworks, which we um, you know, fall under the umbrella of thin media. And uh, the, the concept of thin media is, is that we want to be able to create media that, uh, that is that's super thin, uh, that is transportable, um, and that is conversational. And so what we're seeing is, is that, I, I can give you some examples, but we're seeing that the notification layer, you know, that layer that is you know, basically started off as an alerts layer, um, you know, with, uh, with iOS 8 and iOS 9, it's now become a reverse chronological sort of stream that is, becomes a meta-navigational stream for your, uh, for your experience on the phone. And, and, are so, and are people turning those things off generally or leaving them on or have you seen anything? Well, like I think how the, are people approaching the on-off question with those? I mean, Apple had a, um, I, I think that Apple's relationship with notifications has sort of changed you know, pretty radically through the last four iterations of the operating system. And so Apple was you know, a little bit of a late comer to the notification space. It started over at Android, if I remember right. There was a guy who you know, hacked a iOS uh, notifications uh, instance and Apple actually hired the guy. And then the following uh, release of the operating system, they had notifications. That said is, is that in the early days, notifications were alerts. They were uh, publishers or app providers had the ability to push them and turn them on by default. So you can get very quickly into this sort of tragedy of the commons with notifications where every app provider has an incentive to turn your notifications off. You're like, holy hell, why do I need all these notifications? Turn it off, turn this one off, turn this one off, oh fuck it, turn them all off. And I think that with iOS 8 and 9, we've gotten into a much more functional space with notifications. So iOS 9 has the reverse chronological notifications, I think that all the controls are there on an app by app level, you can, you know, app providers can actually have a link inside of the app where you can navigate straight to the preferences for notifications. You have fine grained uh, preferences where you can, if you can figure them out, which takes a little bit of time, but you can actually sort of manage your notifications. Coupled with that is notifications are becoming actionable. And so what started off as alerts, just like, oh, you should, uh, you should either go this way or Foursquare just saying, hey, you should check out this new restaurant or something, um, is now becoming actually operational where you can swipe a notification and have a, you can actually interact with the app. And so um, there, is a, uh, there is a company that we're an investor in, a Betaworks, that is going to launch uh, in the next 30 days, they're going to launch a polling app that does um, real-time polling solely from the notifications. So, you know, Trump cruise, you know, up or down. And you could just swipe left and just vote. And so it's very, very lightweight, thin media. It's a tough choice, by the way. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get political. <laughs> I didn't make it easy. Um, but, um, so, so you guys are looking at this thin layer on the top, and by thin, you sort of mean like lightweight software. Is what I mean, mean lightweight like software, but it also, you know, I mentioned that another criteria for us is that it becomes conversational is, you know, a really good example is that uh, you know, uh, we have an app which we developed called Poncho, which is a weather app. And um, it, Poncho released uh, a couple of weeks ago, was one of the launch partners that released a Slack bot um, and so, you know, you can install it within, uh, within Slack for your team and Poncho is then available and it's, it's a conversational relationship you yeah. have with Poncho. And so you could see Poncho sort of extending, uh, we're testing something on Kick right now, and so you could see it extending into a conversational sort of these so chapters. Tell people a little bit about Poncho just so they kind of get the context of how Poncho is different than say, you know, the Yahoo Weather app or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, so, um, so Poncho, the, the idea behind Poncho was that, you know, we, um, we, love, we love things at Betaworks where we can build these lightweight apps where we have a deep engagement with our users um, and we can build media or character around them. 
And so we saw uh, the weather space as a space where uh, we could build a lightweight app that we would initially deliver through email and through SMS, and that would be a fun email uh, weather app um, or weather product. Um, you know, really, really push to, uh, to millennials, young people who wanted a weather with an attitude, weather with a voice um, that was very thin and it was delivered direct, pushed to them. Um, we started, uh, we started uh, covering New York City, and uh, we launched here, and we saw that we had a high engagement, and so high open rate, and so like way high. Um, and it was you know, normal open rates, uh, you're lucky if you can get sort of a 10, 15% open rate. We were, I think initially when we started, it was north of 50%, so we were very happy with the open rate. And, and that, for us, is about engagement. That means that people actually, you know, they value this. Yeah. There's something engaging here. And so then we actually spent about, our data science team maybe spent six to nine months working on a, a solution where we could actually scale the data set underneath Poncho because the Poncho app um, was, it was editorially driven. So it was basically, you know, the weather is a commodity. The weather is a, it's the same weather that people are getting yeah. across all these apps. But Poncho has voice. Poncho actually has an attitude and a human being writes that. So the way we think about a lot of these products at Betaworks is we try to use a sort of algorithmic data layer so that we can then give a editorial voice on top of that and scale an editorial voice a lot more effectively than if we're doing just with pure editors. Right, right. And so we spend time doing that. And Interesting. That. So I want to push in. You mentioned Slack for a second. I feel like this is a, it's the, the notifications and the discussion around Slack and in the work environments is sort of a, a place to push into a little bit. Um, how are you looking at the impact of Slack in general as it relates to how you think about the work environment for people? Like, do you, it's, you know, I think at us at the Webby's, we use it a lot. I think when we first started using it, it was very useful. And then we started, we had a couple of people at our office who got really into it and started pushing into all the different bots and things we can hook up to it. And I, I really started looking at it differently, not just as a way of talking to people, but as something that is like a little bit of a tissue or a glue that connects things together. It seems related to the way you're looking at some of the notifications in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think that Slack has opened up a whole new um, sort of component to um, collaborative work and um, and the uh, and, and in work communication, and I think that it's you know a ton of a, a, a ton of attention and time is moving from email into Slack and also I think from Twitter into Slack. Yeah, I and, think that and Twitter, that's something we've all wished yeah. would happen for quite some time, and I never actually thought it would happen, and it really actually seems to be yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah, I think that they're actually. Twitter's most formidable competitor at this point. Um, coming, coming at Twitter sort of from a left flank, from a very different flank, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's related. So I think that you know, they're, they're building, it, it's an awesome company that they're building. We, um, you know, at Betaworks, we had a instance of um, a thing called Beta Chat, which um, Crucial and some of the team, uh, the guys hacked together in the early days, which was, a, uh, it was a very, very primitive version uh, that was, uh, it wasn't off IRC, it was, in, it, was, it was using some of Google's technology. But we then moved to HipChat and used HipChat for quite a while and um, we were moderately happy with that. But then Slack came along and I think that the Slack fixed a bunch of things that HipChat didn't do right. Um, uh, you know, I think that the team structure of it, the uh, discovery search, you know, there are a whole bunch of things which Slack's done fundamentally better. And so it's, you know, it's become a big part of the work environment. And like you said, it's changing. I mean, the, it, it is about technology changing the fabric of these organizations, right? The web has become, the web's become a metaphor. We often talk about beta work, beta works as a network, right? As a network of companies. And I, I am, you know, if you ask me how I spend my day, you know, more than a fifth or quarter of my day is trying to connect companies together that we have um, either a stake in or would like to have a stake in or we want to work with in some way. And so we're building a bunch of things on top of Slack. You know, the Poncho Bot's a good example. We seed invest in a company called XOXCo, which is a, uh, which is building Slack bots. Um, we have, yeah, so those, I, and that sort of change of the fabric of the company, I think, is, 
is really interesting, but that's sort of the you know, part of what the internet's born. Yeah, I mean, so we did a bunch of research uh, around the work environment, people's perception of technology and work, and found some interesting things. One thing, people generally are actually concerned about like losing jobs to technology in the short term. At the same time, most of them are actually using all the software that they're worried about. You know, so we're all using Mint and Tax software, and yeah. we're using five-minute workouts instead of personal trainers and all that kind of stuff. Um, the thing I want to push, ask you a little bit about is like, how do you see? I, I, how are you looking at productivity apps and the way the work environment is going to change in say like the next five to 10, 15 years from now? Um, you see some stuff out there that's like we're only going to have to work six hours because we're going to become so efficient. Um, but if you were to think of like, what's your thesis around what like work life looks like in ten or fifteen years? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that the I, I think that the sort of techno utopian fantasy, you know, you go back to the Jetsons and sort of the early early sort of you know sci-fi representations of the future would all of it. All, the assumption was always that the machine would free us you know, to spend more time with our families, to hang out more, and yet the reality is is that we have just become increasingly embedded in the work, uh, the work, the work experience and in the, and our, and our, the line between, you know, our personal life and our work life has become incredibly blurred. And so, I think that the, um, I think the idea of I think on one side, computers are doing an incredible job of offloading um, a, there's a whole set of, there's a whole set of, I won't call it labor because it's not even being done by human beings. There's a whole set of, um, of machine learning stuff that's being done by computers. The much of it is being put under the rubric of AI. It, it's not, it's not AI. It's, it's, it is machine learning and it is, um, uh, it is, machines doing brute force analysis of massive data sets in ways that human beings could never do that. And that is gonna yield, I think, a whole set of new products and, and new capabilities for human beings, and it's incredibly empowering. I think that there's a set of, so that's on one end of the what, spectrum. What would be just some like small examples of that that people could, that we, you know, that you can sort of I mean, latch onto as a... You know, uh, it, the, the bazillion examples of that, but the facial, the facial recognition stuff, which we see today, and so you know whether it's you know within Snapchat or whether it's in Facebook or whether it's being used by the NSA, you know facial facial recognition has essentially become a a, a problem that is um, I wouldn't say completely solved, but is pretty you know it, it, we're doing a very good job of it now. It could be like a plug-in. So yeah, and, and it's being done at a scale which is really unimaginable, right? And, and I think that it's safe to say that Facebook's probably better than, than anybody in the world, including any government. Because they have so many photos. I mean, they just have so many more photos. Than else, right? Right? Yeah. Which is remarkable to think. So, so there's, um, there's you know, good things and bad things about that, but that's, a, that's an example of a brute force application of machine learning that has been done at massive scale and is, is not really, it's not machines thinking, it's not AI, but it is a, um, uh, it's, a it's a narrow application uh, and, uh, and it's hugely useful. I, there are bazillion others, I mean the, the ones which are well publicized, you know, with Watson and, um, uh, you know, playing chess and playing Jeopardy yeah. are good examples. So again, I mean that is, it's, it is, <clears throat> uh, this is brute force, uh, massive data sets being analyzed. And so I, I think that that side of what machines are gonna do is most of it is incredibly empowering. I mean, there's a whole set of questions that relate to civil liberties and that relate to government, which we have to, as a society, we have to figure out what the lines are there. But I think that that is very empowering. I think that there's a set of, um, there's a set of things in the robotic space that we're gonna see in the next 10 years that are gonna uh, also be incredibly emp empowering. I think that the, uh, the, the, we, we have such a tendency to, um, uh, to assume that robots need to be like humans, right? Um, I think that most of the robots we're gonna see in the next 10 years look and see, they, they look and feel nothing like humans, right? Every sort of, you know, every earth mover that you see, um, you know, helping build building, um, you know, around town here, you know, those massive machines, 
you know, could easily be you know, powered and, sure, by and, software. and probably more safely by yeah. software. Yeah. And so I know this stuff is, it's, it's scary to think, but the reality is, is that most airplanes that you know, we get on today are actually being flown. Sure, the land, most of them are landed by uh, some, some level of software yeah. at this point, right? Yeah, and so, I mean, there was a woman um, last year who I spoke with who um, um, flew fighter jets um, on a, uh, for, for the U.S., and she explained to me, she said that, you know, before they take off now on aircraft carriers, the last thing they have to do is go like this to show that then they've got no hands, <laughs> right? That they're not using their hands. And so, so you can see that there's, you know, I, I know self-driving cars and all this stuff. It seems like it's um, like way off, but it's actually it, it's it's happening very very quickly. Yeah. So uh, we have like a minute or two left. I want to wrap up on something that's like probably closer to home. And you talked about Facebook a little bit. Are we going to look at our phones less and look at people more, or are we are we hopelessly determined to stare at our phones for the next twenty years? I think that our devices have to become, you know, more invisible, and they have to become less sort of less in, our devices will and have to, they have to mediate our experiences less. So that the idea of me holding up my phone to you, um, I think is gonna, that is gonna change because camera's gonna proliferate, I won't need to do that. And because people will figure out smart ways of doing it, right? The, the, there's a company here in New York called Beam, B-E-M-E, who had some innovation about just like taking the phone and just like putting it against your chest and then it would start recording. And so it wouldn't be that I have to go in front of you and Casey and the team there wanted to, something that wasn't mediated. So I think the technology is gonna be, we're gonna be less mediated, but I can't, but I think that we are, you know, we're incredibly dependent upon this technology. And you know, I have three small kids and you know, I see the way they relate to technology. The experience is gonna become more, um, more embedded in our lives, more embedded in our social structure and our communications, but it's going to be it's, technology is going to be a fundamental part of it. So it's kind of the technology will disappear, but it's going to be there. We'll accept it more, and we'll probably get better at, at putting it into the right places. So right. Yeah. So you know, you'll have contact lenses on now that are giving you prompts that it's time to wrap up um, instead of looking over at that lady there. So. It's a good place to it's a good place to end. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving you a big hand for John. Thank you so much.